I am happy to welcome journalist and author Paula Ferris to the show. Paula, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Jane. Great to be with you today. Absolutely. Now, Paula, you are a very hard worker because I can remember seeing you doing sports in Chicago. And then yeah. I remember you leaving and going to New York. And I was actually working in London. And obviously, time zones are different. I would turn on the digital ABC channel, and there you were anchoring what appeared to be the middle of the night in the United yes. States blurry eyed and all. And I said, wow, she works so hard. Hard work has always sort of been part of who you are, right? Yeah, I think so. My parents instilled that hard work ethic in me. Maybe it's because my dad came from, you know, his, he was an immigrant family from Lebanon. And, you know, I just knew that, you know, whatever you do, work hard, no matter in what capacity. I've been, you know, throughout my life, I've worked in fast food and I've been a waitress. I've been an environmental control engineer, aka a janitor, like, you know, just to pay the bills. And so I, I just take great pride in working hard and no matter what capacity it is, capacity it is. Yeah. And I'm always so proud of you for that because I love watching you grow. And here we are today. I look at you, I go, wow, she's a co-host of The View. She was a co-host at Good Morning America weekend. And then all of a sudden you quit. Yeah, I know. I got, I was burned out, Jane. <laughs> I really, I burned out. I think we're told um, in society, especially as women, that we have to lean in and we have to work hard and that and we're also told that our worth is in work and that our values and vocation and we have to find this one thing that we're quote unquote called to do. And so I worked as hard as I possibly could and I got to the top anchoring Good Morning America weekends, co-hosting The View. And then I looked around and I was like, my life's a disaster. I've met a professional high, but a personal low. So. What good is it for a man or woman to gain the world but to lose their soul in the process? And so I knew I had to make some tough decisions. My relationships with my kids and my husband were suffering, and um, I'm a person of faith. My relationship with God was suffering. My health was suffering. And then I went through this season where uh, I write about it in my book, where within seven months I had five kind of freak things happen to me. I had a miscarriage with an emergency surgery. I had a concussion at work. Someone threw an object at my head. And I was concussed for three weeks. I was knocked out of work. The day I was cleared to go back to work, Jane, I get in a head-on car crash, then influenza, then pneumonia. And I just knew I had to slow down. So I slowed down. I got off the fast track. And then I realized once I did, I don't know who I am outside of doing. I don't know who I am outside of my job. And so that's why I write a lot of the book. And I, I think we've all misplaced our significance in some capacity. For me, it was career. And when that shifted, which we all experience shifts, vocational shifts throughout our life. But for me, when that shifted, I just had no clue who I was outside of it. So let's talk about your book, because all of these changes happen in your life. You left The View, you left Good Morning America, and you wrote a book called out why I traded my two dream jobs for a life of true calling. You know, I was I never wanted to write a book. I have friends who have told me it is the most painful process alive. And so I was like, I'm never writing a book. And I had publishers approach me, I think probably just because I worked in network news to write a book. And I was like, I don't have anything to say. But two years ago when I walked away and I realized I was lost without this job, I was lost without doing. Um, and I had bought those lies that society told me. And even in the faith circles, we're told, find this one thing you're good at. I was like, you know what? I, I felt I, on my heart, I need to write about this because I think there are so many of us that we don't know who we are outside of what we do. And when that doing shifts in any in any capacity, then we don't know who we are. It's going to we're going to experience an identity crisis. That's what I did. I had a complete identity crisis. Um, and so the books, it's my my story, but I also interview others because I'm a journalist, I have to interview people, um, and just who I am. I interview other people, and then it's observations and anecdotes from other people who've misplaced their significance. And then how we found true purpose and true calling that don't shift and shake, whether you experience a personal crisis like the one I went through or the one that we're in right now. It is a fantastic book, a great read, so, so many things that we can all relate to in, in whatever vocation that we have. But two themes that I noticed, and, and really, you know, that first opening chapter, when you're about to quit and you're talking to the president of ABC and telling him what's 
on your mind. I mean, I was there. I, I, I felt mm -hmm. like, wow, this is, this is fiction, you know, but this is real life. So the two themes are being led by fear and then also being addicted to our jobs. Yeah. And so many people can relate to that. How do we, you know, what kind of advice do you have for people that are led by fear or they are addicted to work and, and they don't really even know it yet? Yeah, I think, you know, for me, I knew I had to make a shift because I had that sense in my spirit. Some people um, are feel stuck in their vocation because they make too much money. Some don't make enough. Some feel a shift. And I always say, follow the peace. So Jane, if you feel it's time to shift, follow the peace that's in your spirit. And you can have a peace about something, but still be scared of hell. That you know that the next step you're gonna take is gonna be scary. I was paralyzed by my fears stepping away. Cause I was like, people are gonna think I'm an idiot. They're gonna think I'm crazy. That like, I couldn't hack it, that I'm a failure, that I'm a husband, that I'm washed up. And then I was scared of what I was walking into. Cause I knew that this chapter hadn't been written, but I knew I had to take that step. So for me, I, I think you should anticipate fear and expect fear. It's not something that we're cured of, you know, or, you know, that we can be healed from. It, it's nothing that we conquer. We should expect fear to manifest itself in the indecisions, in, in big and small decisions. But it's up to us to press into the fear, to take that step, like Martin Luther King says, take a step on the staircase or take that first step when you can't see the rest of the staircase and you look back at your own life I'm a person of faith I know whenever I've had a piece about something but I've still been scared that when I take that step when I press into my fear when I push into it that it always works out on the other side but it's a matter of trust it's a matter of like trusting that peace in your spirit knowing that I'm going to do this but it's up to you to take that step nobody else can take that step for you and you look at yourself on the other side of that fearful moment, you're a stronger person. You're a more confident, self-assured person. And you don't have any regrets because you know like you're never going to have a regret about, gosh, did I just wait till the last 20 years of my life? Or, you know, I know I should have done that, but I was too scared. So yeah. I, I would just say expect and anticipate the fear. It's totally normal. You're not going to conquer it, but it's up to you to press into it. But follow the peace. If you have a peace, proceed. But don't confuse peace and fear. Don't, and fear. People think if I am scared that that's my intuition. No, fear is normal. Fear is totally normal. Um, the peace, the peace, that's what you want to go for, the peace in your spirit. Yeah, and I love the idea of peace because some people say follow your gut or follow your intuition. And I feel like sort of you're, you're, you're you know, I can see that you're gesturing to your abdomen or your gut. And Down maybe here. Yeah, right. This comes. is what I was actually doing. <laughs> like, what is she pointing to? Yeah. You know, I get it because it is about your gut, but it. But you talk a lot about faith in the book as well, and having faith that if you do something in fear, or if you can be unaddicted to your job and take a next step by following your gut, that faith will guide you through it. As you do mention that it, gu it guided you through your college life, it guided you through your first yeah. job, and then moving to New York. Yeah, well, faith, faith is, my faith's always been a big part of my life. It's not just, it, it, I can't really see myself outside of it. It's not like I have this faith on the side. It's really who I am and it dictates everything. And I think that's where I really felt the need to make a change because the, the choices that I was making professionally and personally, frankly, were really clashing with the professed values that I had. I'd become a different person and, um, and everyone was getting my leftovers. So for me, faith has always guided me. I know it doesn't guide everybody. Um, and I re totally respect that. But it's something it's held, it's held me together. It's held my marriage together multiple occasions. And I feel like, for me, God's never let me down. When he has vocationally called me to do something, he's always equipped me to do it. Uh, but but I'm also commanded, and, you know, Joshua 1, it's, I don't know if you're familiar with, with the Bible or not, but God has called Joshua to take down the city of Jericho. So you may have just heard that story. He asks him to circle seven times. I don't know why. He's supposed to take down the city, but God says, I need you to circle seven times. And so often we feel like we're circling. We're like, I don't know why I'm circling. But for me, I think it's, it's an opportunity to be obedient, to, to be refined. We know what we have to do. We have to step, in, step, into, our, step into our fear 
And then when it's time for Joshua to take down the city, God says, have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged for the Lord your God's with you everywhere you go. So that right there tells me I'm commanded to actually press into my fear. God acknowledges my fear, but then he promises he's going to be there. And I'm, I'm quick to call God out. I'm like, hey, hey, I feel peace. I'm going to take a step. You, you better meet me on the other side. And he always has. He always has. But it's just stepping into that. And then that, and that was something that you, you, you found, I mean, you obviously had to do a lot of digging and soul searching to make the decision you made to quit your two dream jobs and to have that conversation and then to write the book. And in the book, you talk about finding your life's purpose over Mm -hmm. finding your life's vocation. And I feel like so many of us sort of are at odds with what those two things mean. Some people find their life's purpose while having their dream vocation. Some people think they're one and the same. Uh, I know for me, one day I woke up and I know one day I thought, oh, my, my life's purpose is to have a TV show. And then I woke up and I realized, no, my life's purpose is to spread love everywhere I go. So explain the difference um, in your mind, how those two things kind of work together and how they can work. Yeah, I'll tell you where I had it wrong. Um, I thought my life's purpose was to be the best broadcaster that I could be. And so I would introduce myself, Paula Ferris and Good Morning America and The View. And Jane, when that changed, who was I? I had no clue. So that's why like, when I was in that space of realizing I'd gotten it all wrong, I, I, I thought, okay, we, we have these two callings. We have a purpose or a faith. I call it my faith calling, but I, I'll say purpose. We have this purpose. And for you, it's to love people. It's not to love people and to have your TV show because you notice if your TV show changes, then you're not going to know who you are outside of it. So your purpose is it's who you are. It's why you're on this earth it has nothing to do with career, work, job, status, anything. And it will never change throughout your life. Your vocational calling will change throughout your life and your vocational calling where you are now. It's just the vehicle by which you're going to love people. For me, my vocation is the vehicle by which I'll love God and love people. That's my faith calling or purpose. It's just the conduit. And once you're A, released from that lie that we're told that our worth is only in our work, then you're given the permission to see yourself outside of this one thing, to peel back the layers, to, to, I don't have, I'm not just this one thing for the rest of my life. I can branch out and I can try new things because this isn't my identity. This is just how I'm fulfilling my purpose. Um, so that's what I hope the book does. I hope it helps people discover their purpose, um, know their worth. And then like kind of once you've done that, then you're like, okay, now it's time for me to figure out what are my talents and gifts. And in the book, I, I conduct an interview with this gentleman and he really, the way that he articulated vocational calling was beautiful. Cause he said, it's three things. What are you good at? What do you love? And what do trusted people notice you're good at and you love? Okay, all three of those things you have to check off. You can't just be good at it. You can't just love it. Good at it, love it, and trusted people have to speak life into that. And I look back in my life, and I, I've always been curious. My nickname was Paula 20 Questions. I love to get to the bottom of the story. I'm an effective communicator, and I had trusted people, my high school teacher and my college professors that were speaking life into this. Yes, those talents and gifts manifest themselves and a vocational capacity of broadcasting. But do you see how once you peel that back, curiosity, question asking, communicating, that can that can go on so many different vocational branches, not just broadcasting. So I've like been given permission to see myself outside of this one thing, knowing that I can be used in a myriad of different vocational branches, and so can you, and so can those watching. What are you good at? What do you love? What do trusted people notice you're good at and you love? My friend, She's, she's, I asked her these questions. She said, well, I love to encourage people, and I'm a really good listener. Well, she's a podcaster, she's an author, and she's also a counselor. So do you see how those gifts have manifested themselves in different branches, in different capacities? She's not just one thing. Do you think it's possible for everyone to find their life's purpose and live through it in vocation? Yeah, I think so. You, well, first of all, you have to find your you need to come up with a definitive purpose statement. My purpose statement, Jane, is I'm Paula Ferris. I'm a wife. I'm a mom. I love Jesus. I'm curious. I ask questions. And I am a champion of and challenger of people. That's who I am. That's never going to change regardless of a crisis, whether pandemic or personal. 
you come up with that purpose statement and then you allow that to be your vocation, just the vehicle by which you're going to do that. But you have to come up with that purpose statement that doesn't have anything to do with doing. It's who you are. And it's what's never going to change about you. The inherent talents and gifts you have, your personality and the type of person that you want to be. Not nothing to do with career. You've got to just remove that from the equation. And then, and then once, you know, and then, and then just allow your, you just have need a paradigm shift. My vocation is just the vehicle by which I'm going to fulfill that purpose statement. It's all going to go back to that purpose statement while you're here. So you share a lot of personal stuff in the book. Uh, you call it your year of hell and lots of bad things happen to you, illness, uh, miscarriages, getting, getting the concussion, uh, everything that you had said. Some crazy things, some crazy things. Uh, yeah, crazy things happen to you. I mean, I saw the signs right there, you know, right in front of you. Why do you think that was important to put into the book? Um, I think it's important to put into book because it was really the impetus by which I decided to, to step away. I mean, some of us have the, the intelligence and the wisdom uh, and discernment to just look around and see, gosh, my life's off. My values are clashing with the choices I'm making. My relationships aren't good. My professed values, yeah, they're like, mm -mm, it's not happening. That was all present, but I was so stubborn and stupid, Jane, that I didn't listen to those signs. I didn't, I, even I, I assessed my landscape. It wasn't enough that it was on fire. I had to go through this personal crisis and I feel like that's where my attention, that's where God got my attention. And he's like, if you don't slow down, I'm gonna slow you down. So you have to pay attention to the signs that are happening, to the things that are happening around you. Yeah, so many great things to learn from the book, you know, from seeing the signs and having faith and understanding who you are. What is the sort of overall theme or agenda that you want people to take away? Yeah, um, it, I want people to be able to discover their true purpose um, and calling that won't shift and shape in a pandemic or a personal crisis, to find out who you are outside of what you do, to determine purpose, to know your worth, and then help you find vocational lanes. But before you even think about my vocational lane, you got to be released from the lie that your worth is your work that your value is vocation and that your calling is just your career. You've got to release yourself from that. Takes a lot of practice to do that. Let's switch gears really quick. I want to talk about the view yeah. because yeah. everybody wants to talk about the view. I mean, what a place to be everybody sitting. Wants to talk about the view, yeah. I sat in the audience at the view and watched you guys. I was like, wow, this is so great. I could never do this show. They're so smart. <laughs> And I'm not going to ask about, you know, the quote unquote infighting that we hear or the bickering or what have you. When you are hired to be a co-host of The View and share your opinion, but you can't really have an opinion as a journalist, how were you able to do that with sort of being neutral? It was tough. I write about it in the book. And in some senses, I felt like a failure because the viewers have come to expect, as they should, strong, opinionated co-hosts. Now, when I was first asked to do it, um, they said, you know, be Meredith Vieira, who was the moderator, by the way. I was not the moderator. But they said, be like Meredith, um, no political opinions. But at the time, this was 2015, Donald Trump wasn't in office yet. It, we weren't, at, at this moment in The View's history, we were talking about pop culture. Um, you know, so things I could easily give my opinion on. Faith, family, food, relationships, sex, everything. Like, yes, I'm in. We'll talk about it all. But then Donald Trump gets elected and the show becomes very, very political, but I'm still working under that edict of no political opinion. And it became challenging because here's what I know the viewers should expect and here's what I'm able to give them. And it's 50% because I could never own my own political opinion because I was told not to. And I remember when I was doing The View, I was still anchoring a news show. I was still anchoring Good Morning America. And so... I didn't want, I, I felt at any moment I could say something that would totally ruin my news career. And I, so I felt like I was walking a tightrope in many regards. Um, but the thing I learned from that show is that I can sit down with somebody and disagree without being disagreeable. That I, it, it showed me the art of seeing a person for a person and not a person for policy. I don't look at Joy and Whoopi as a Democrat. You know, I, 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 I think I see 
I, I, and this is where my faith really, you know, really guides me. It's like, I can see a person for a person, that person is policy. And I know that they are made in the image of God. They're fearfully and wonderfully made. They're knit together in their mother's womb. I can love and respect them because of that. Even though I might not have anything in common with them, um, I can still love and respect that person and they're worthy of that. So it taught me to disagree without being disagreeable and see people as people. Yeah, and I love the fact that you're able to have an experience in life and walk away learning something because yep. that's why we have experiences because we're better after them. Because mm -hmm. if you ever think that, oh, I'm the best at this or I know who that person is, then we're wrong and we haven't learned our lesson from that experience. Yeah, and I think you, I've learned more from my failures than my successes. And I would say the view is probably more failure than success for me because that I just felt like I couldn't give the audience what they wanted and what they needed um, and what they've grown to expect because of the weird position that I was put in. And I take responsibility for it, but I wouldn't do it any different because I've learned so much from the experience. And, you know, Joy and Whoopi are some of my dear friends today. The ladies on The View, it's one big sorority. Yes, like, we fight like family on camera. And then, you know, afterwards, it's like family. And you're just like, okay, what you want to come to my dressing room? What was that lipstick color that you had on? I loved it. It's, it's truly a family atmosphere and a family vibe where you just kind of move on. You know, it, that's what family does. You fight and then you move on. We're just about two years removed from the day that you said, I'm done, I quit my two dream jobs. And now you're doing a podcast, Journey of Faith. Is that right? Yep, Journeys of Faith. It was something that I had, uh, when I'm, I opened the book, the first line of the book is, there's no rational way to kill your career. I'm having, a, I'm having lunch with my boss, who's the president of ABC News, and I'm telling them I'm quitting these jobs and that I said, can I launch a faith podcast? And he was supportive. And so... I wanted it to be an opportunity to talk to people of many faiths about what they believe and why. So I talked to influencers and newsmakers, just peel back the layers to give them a platform on a mainstream platform to talk about, to talk about their faith. Cause they're not, that doesn't happen on a mainstream level. You just see them in a different light. And it's a great opportunity too to like, especially in this moment we're in, I talk to, I don't just, this isn't just ideologues. I'm not just hearing what I want to hear and seeing what I want to see. I'm talking to, to Sikhs and Buddhists and agnostics and atheists and, and Jews and Muslims. And I'm learning about their cultures and tradition. I know what I believe, okay? Um, but, I'm, but we are learning about uh, our cultures and traditions and the things that are important to one another. And you're having these really wonderful, respectful conversations and that's what our country needs to just show up as our true self, whatever you may be, show up as your true self, be unabashed, be unafraid, be unashamed. And uh, the moment you start doing that, other people will, and you're going to have these really great conversations that need to happen. And then you start breaking down barriers and, you know, pushing past the ignorance of the naivete. And um, so anyway, it's been really great. It's been really great, the podcast. And it sounds too like you can still be a journalist because you're doing the, the research and the interviewing and the question asked, answering and asking. So Journeys of Faith is the podcast. And is there anything else that you're working on the horizon for us to look out for? I feel like because I no longer believe that worth is work and I can see myself, um, I give myself the permission to branch out. I'm, I'm getting ready to make some more changes. So I'm excited. Um, it's always scary because you don't know what that chapter is going to look like, but there are things that are on my heart that I really want to pursue and, um, using those, the curiosity and the question asking, you know, doesn't mean I just have to be a broadcaster forever. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to walk into that space and to see how it all, how it all works out, just pressing into the fear, but, you know, looking forward to branching out. Wonderful. Paul, I told you we were together at Wrigley Field one time in our life. And in person, I said, I am so proud of you. Oh. And that was when you left Chicago and you went to New York. And here we are today on Creative Living. And I'm proud of you for all that you've accomplished and what you're teaching us. So thank you for telling us your story. Oh, thank you, Jay. That means so much. That really does. So I hope the book really encourages people. I really do. And gives them the tools that they need. I highly recommend everybody read your book, Called Out. I am halfway through it. I love the book. Paula Ferris, thank you so much. Thank you, Jane. Go Cubs. <laughs>